I want to. All right. So uh, welcome everyone to session five of Bible 101. Um, glad you could join us on this snowy Sunday. Um, and it's been a year. Uh, we did the other series in January. Um, and this new one, unlike the first, is not going to be every week. It's just going to be once a month on the second okay. Sunday of the month. And I haven't looked forward to April to see if that's going to mess us up with Holy Week. So I'll have to check that out. Uh, I know that uh, Ash Wednesday is March 2nd, as Beth told us this morning. So we'll, we'll figure that out. Later. For how many months, Al, is this going to go on? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, probably until the summer, you know, maybe. Okay. okay. Uh, that's up to Beth, really. Um, so she and I haven't discussed that. We just were anxious to get a couple into the bank there. So here we are. So um, these are not going to be sequential. The other series, the first four series were sequential. You know, you kind of built one onto another, uh, but these are all going to be standalone sessions. And so that's, that's a good thing. Um, and today's session is, base, is focused on interpretation. It's using two stories, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. And I hope we can expand the way that we encounter scripture. Is everybody hear me okay? Is, is the volume good? All right. Yeah. Um, and let's see here. I need to bring these notes closer so I can read them. Okay. As always, yes. As always, please feel please feel free to interrupt or ask questions or offer contrary opinions. Those all are welcome. Um, and those comments really make our time special. So I'm I'm really encouraging everyone to feel free to share and open up in whatever way that you want to. Uh, I certainly do not claim to have all the answers. I don't even have most of the answers, but anyway, uh, and even all the questions. But in any case, I, uh, this is a collaboration between all of us, uh, among all of us, I should say. And, uh, and that's, that's the way, I'm just a facilitator. Okay, so we're going to talk about encountering the miraculous in the 21st century. Because when you read the Bible, there are going to be these parts that are you know, miraculous. There's no other way to get around it. What they're claiming, what they think, what they're reporting is having happened um, are not easy to explain without the use of movie effects or something. But uh, all of, all of the, the passages we're going to look at today will, would be considered a little bit of the stuff of fantasy. When we encounter the miraculous, we're confronted with our 21st century scientific minded instincts and reminded of special effects in movies and for most of us, we have no personal experience in our specific lives to, that would be considered a miracle. Some people think if they can't accept the miraculous, they shouldn't even read the Bible, either because they feel their faith is insufficient or because they don't want to be associated with what you might call magical thinking. Does any of this resonate with any of you? Do, you, do any of you feel that way? You know, if you can't really buy the miracle stuff, why am I even re reading this in the first place? Mm. I sometimes let myself think of it as a literary uh, device. And so I haven't forced myself to say, if you don't believe every single thing, you can't participate. Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's good. Anybody else? Okay, um, so uh, where would you like to talk about where you find yourself today as regards the miraculous? And, uh, Jane has shared that she looks at it as kind of a literary device, and there's a lot of really good things that can come from looking at it that way. Does anybody else have something that this happened? Yeah, go ahead, Valerie. Oh, uh, I'm mute. There you go. I. Um... I often think of some of it as legend and legend always has a small kernel of truth and I can accept it that way um, and have always been able to. That's a very good. I think it's a larger piece of what they're trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's excellent. Anybody else have anything they want to throw in? So for the purposes of our session today, we're going to just take the miraculous details that we find at face value, at least at first, and then we can double back to consider them from other points of view, such as some of the ones that have already been suggested. So we're now going to look at the, uh, the Old Testament one. So you, I'll give you a few minutes to find the book of Joshua, chapter three, 
Joshua is after the first five books of the Bible, you know, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then it comes to Joshua. Joshua judges Ruth. That's as far as I could go at the moment. But anyway, so uh, Joshua chapter three uh, and verse <coughs> seven is where we're going to start. Now, you all have, how many of you have heard of Joshua and the battle of Jericho? Yeah, pretty much everybody that's not looking for Jericho. Jericho. There you go. Jericho. And, and the trumpet blast and the walls came tumbling down. Yep, that is certainly miraculous. But we're going to consider an earlier passage in the book of Joshua, two chapters before the Jericho story, which offers a different kind of miracle. So we're at Joshua chapter three. We're going to start at verse seven, and we're going to read all the way to the end of chapter four. I'll read it to you. Um, just let your mind kind of just float along with it. There's some repetition in there, as often is the case. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, how the Israelites crossed from the River Jordan into the Holy Land, into the, into the Promised Land, and about the 12 stones that were taken from the River Jordan. As you hear these verses, pay particular attention to the sequence of events and the details that are offered. So here we go. Just sit back and enjoy the story. Here we go. Chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You remember that Joshua succeeded Moses. Moses is gone now, and Joshua is in charge. You're the one who shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know that among you is the living God who, fall, who without fail will drive out from you. And then there's this really long list of people like Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, and so on and so forth. I'm going to skip over that. <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. So now select 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe. When the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord of all the earth, rests in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan flowing from above, from the north, shall be cut off. They shall stand in a single heap. This should sound vaguely familiar. We'll get to that. We'll get back to that. When the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped into the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is besides Zarathon, while those flowing towards the sea of the uh, yeah towards the sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. So it was like they turned off a spigot. Uh, while all Israel were crossing over on dry ground, or at least damp ground, uh, the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, this is chapter four we're in now, the Lord said to Joshua, select 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, take 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet, priest's feet stood, carry them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the 12 men from the Israelites, whom he had appointed, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, Pass on before the Ark of the Covenant, your God, in the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder and one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. The Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the, of, the, of the Israelites, as the Lord told Joshua, carried them over with them to the place where they camped and laid them down there. Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan in the place where their feet, where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. The priest bore the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was finished, and the, and the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people crossed over in haste. 
As soon as all the people had finished crossing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in front of the people. The Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of, tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the Israelites, as Moses had ordered them. About 40,000 armed for war crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for battle. Uh, let's see. I'm going all the way to the end, I think. Yeah, 424. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. The Lord said to Joshua, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant to come out of the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. When the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the middle of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet touched dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Hmm. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in, the, in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. These 12 stones which they had taken out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, saying to the Israelites, when your children ask their parents in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then your children, then let your, you shall let your children know Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, ding, 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 which he dried up for us until we crossed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and so that you may fear the Lord your God <coughs> forever. Okay, that was a long passage. I'm sorry it was so long, but it's okay. know, reasons for why I read it all. So how many of you have ever heard that story before? Not really. All right, we got Valerie. We got okay, Scotty. Yep. Uh, uh, one of the one of you guys over there, Sue and uh, Patrick. One of you guys had heard it before. I thought, yeah, Patrick had heard it. Okay, but most of us, I had never heard it before. That was a new one on me. I didn't know that there were two crossings of bodies of water where the water was stopped. You know, we we have good coverage for the Red Sea incident thanks to Cecil B. DeMille, but uh, Cecil B. DeMille never tried to do one about the Jordan. He he let that one go. Um, so. What strikes you about this passage besides its evident wordiness? Needed a good editor. How would you summarize the events that were depicted? Anybody, anybody offer me a quick summary of what happened? And what, what, if you had to tell this to somebody in a paraphrase, what would you say? <clears throat> Joshua was trying to succeed Moses and had to perform the same trick so that people would believe him. Yeah, that's a good believe point. Believe in him. Yeah, yeah. It was a validation of Joshua and his leadership, certainly. The fact that he was doing what Moses had done. Anything else? They chose uh, one person representing each tribe. Each one chose a stone, but they also, those were their bearers of the ark. So they were carrying their, I assume, religious artifacts with them as they went. Oh, what's in the Ark of the Covenant? That's, Is that's it the good... Torah? Is it the, the Ten Torah? Commandments. Oh. Ten Commandments. Oh, okay. Remember, okay. Remember, remember Mount Sinai? Notice, again, go back to Cecil B. DeMille. He's up on the yeah. mountain. Yeah. Oh, okay. God carves out the Ten Commandments. And what do they do with the Ten Commandments? They put them in the ark. Okay. They had plenty of gold because, as you might remember, while he was up getting the Ten Commandments, the people had thrown all their gold into a big cauldron and made a golden calf. And when yep. he got done and aggravated with them about that, they melted down the golden calf, and then they could make the Ark of the Covenant and so on. Uh, so, yeah, that's what's in there. It was the... It was the uh, it was a it was a relic of, of of consummate holiness because this is something God Himself wrote, carved, if you will. What else about this story? Anything else jump out at you? Oh, what, so why are they coming across the Jordan? I, I don't know if you know much about biblical geography. It's kind of hard to get a good grasp of that. But uh, Jericho is east or west of the Jordan. One or the other. West. Jericho is west, is west of the Jordan, that's right. And, and Egypt is also even further west. So if they were coming from Egypt, how did they get on the wrong side of the Jordan? Any ideas? So God, remember, was angry with them because he, they didn't follow his instructions in the desert. Yeah. So he made them stay in the desert longer and they wound up going all the way around your elbow to get to your thumb. And they wound up coming to the Jordan from the east. And they had to cross the Jordan in order to get into to, to cross over into Jericho, which is west of the Jordan. Okay. Now, where did the 12 stones from the river end up? That's what I've always wondered. Okay. Well, what does it says they're there? 
So where are they? Okay, but it, okay. What does the what does the story actually say about where the stones end up? On the ground. In Gilgal, on the east border of Jericho. Okay, that's yes. It does say that. Does it say anything else? It also says they were left in the river. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we got a contradiction going here. Are they Are they on the dry land? Where did they wind up? It doesn't say necessarily that he they one... got 24 stones. It says they got 12 stones, but some part of this says they went and put them where they were camping, and the other said leave them in the river so that everybody can see it in the river. Although, and of course the current in the Jordan is not all that strong. So maybe they could withstand the current to stay up, and but they say you can see them in the river. But in any no. case. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. No. No? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, go ahead. It's in there somewhere. I read it just now. I remember reading it. <laughs> so yeah, at one point it says you put the stones where the bolt bearers or the ark are standing in the river. And then right. another part it says take them to your encampment. Yeah. Uh, Gilgal well, outside said, of Jericho. Right. And leave they also, them there and point it out to your kids. You know what this means? Yes, exactly right. That's right. That's right. It was part of the Holy Land tour. So uh, yes, absolutely, <laughs> that, that's correct. Now, um, we there isn't, and there's a lot of. Did you notice in this story how it keeps going back and forth? Mm -hmm. You know, you you got the situation, you understand the circumstances. They're in the river, and then all of a sudden, you're telling the story all over again. And they're not in the river yet. And he says, go in there, pick out the 12, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of, of repetitive detail uh, and, and flashback, if you will, or, or whatever, of the same information. More than one time, as it said, all, almost every detail in the story. Uh, so you can ask yourself, this is supposed to be inspired scripture. How come all this messiness, narrative messiness, let's call it, uh, is there? And why are some of the details contradicting the, you know, each other in the account. Why would Holy Scripture contain this contradiction? Any ideas on that? Well, it was originally told as a story, verbal story, not written down. And the guy was trying to tell the story and his wife kept interrupting him. And he had to go back. No, it was the 12, every, one from every tribe. And she said, were the stones in the river or did they put them? And he could go back. There was one from each tribe, 12 guys. Oy vey, you don't understand what I'm telling you. Yeah. Pay attention and listen to what I'm saying to you. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. Yes, yeah, Sue. It doesn't say how long it took them to cross the Jordan. Maybe no. there was a drought and therefore the river. No, it, was, had... it was in flood, actually. It was in flood. They said this is the time of harvest and it was in flood. <laughs> so, uh, but they, you're right. It doesn't say how long it took. Any and other was... thoughts about why there would be contradiction? There Does was also the... heat. Yeah, go ahead. And the waters that come down from above and they shall stand upon a heap. So there was some kind of rising up in the middle of a pile of stones or whatever in the middle of the river. The, 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 water, the, the water was up in a heap as well as the stones. The, <laughs> the waters of the Jordan were raised up like Cecil B. DeMille depicted it in his movie, uh, okay. just like in, in uh, uh, the Red Sea incident. It's, caused, you know, it's up like a tidal wave that's freeze framed, right? It's up high and stopped and not, fo not going forward. So that's, the, that's part of the story of the heap is that the waters are in a heap and then they also heap the stones. So there's that nice kind of, go ahead. Uh, I, I see other people wanting to jump in. I, I'm confused because well, my, Bible, my Bible talks about take 12 prepared stones from the midst of the Jordan. And then further on, it says then Joshua also said, another 12 stones in the Jordan. Oh, ah. interesting. So, okay, maybe there are 24 stones. In the place walked were... on by the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So the, first of all, we have him taking the prepared stones, whatever the prepared means. And then I have in chapter, uh, verse, chapter four, verse nine, then Joshua also set another 12 stones in the oh. Jordan itself. 
Mine says it's other a, also. Yeah. Joshua put other 12 stones in the midst of the channel. So, uh, 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 Jane, what oh, translation are you reading from? Yeah. Yeah. Um, mine is an old Catholic Bible, I'm sure, from 1948. Okay, and Patrick, what are you reading from? Which translation? Which I'm version? reading from the Orthodox Study Bible. Okay, and so in the New Revised Standard Version, they don't say other stones. They just say 12 stones. So <laughs> this agreement in the different versions. I also, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. And in um, verse 9, it says Joshua set up a second monument. So maybe that's part of it. There's different interpretations. I yes, huh. yes. And, and, and the reason that there are in these different versions, I think, is an attempt to resolve the contradiction. Contradiction makes people reading the Bible nervous <laughs> and anxious. And they just don't quite get why they're, you know, they want the Bible to be inerrant and accurate and truthful and no ambiguity. And when they run into these, these conflicts, these contradictions, they look for any way that they can to get rid of them. But I'm going to suggest to you other reasons why there might be contradictions. So here we go. Finding contradictions. Let's see if I can get out of the way enough. There we go. Uh, results from careful reading. And God wants us to read the Bible that carefully. So in a way, when you find contradictions, uh, that's kind of an affirmation that you are reading closely. God wants us to read closely, and he's got stuff there for us to find. This is almost like Where's Waldo, essentially. <laughs> okay. Here's the second reason. Contradictions make us less likely to read the entire Bible literally. Uh -huh. hmm. if, you, if you come across these contradictions, it's going to be harder to take it literally because you're going to be in conflict. Hmm. So this is, this is one of my... Uh, special answers to people who swear that the Bible is textually inerrant, I go to that. I, I show them some places where it contradicts each other, and then I say, I don't know that we're supposed to read the words literally. That's another idea. So why would that be a good idea? It's, is it possible that what is more vital about the Bible are the truths that it contains, not its specific words? And the third thing that you see on the slide, if I can get out of the way enough, when you try to reconcile the contradictory details, doing so might allow you to think about the passage in a different way, or more importantly, in a way that may be unique to you. You may find that it also sparks your imagination in an unusual way. So, that's another way of looking at why the contradictions are there, especially if you're one of those people that are bothered by contradiction, this would allow you to not be quite as bothered, that it's okay for there to be contradiction because God has a higher purpose in mind, I'm suggesting. Hmm. How long after this took place would this have been recorded? The, the, the book of Joshua when it was yeah. written? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head to, Beth, you, do you remember that? Oh, you're, you're muted. I think you're muted. Yeah. I definitely don't remember that, but um, <laughs> usually in the study Bible, um, it makes a guess. But as mentioned earlier, it would have been oral story before yeah. it was written down on a scroll. Um, okay. Let's see. And then it probably would have had later editors too. I don't know that this is mentioning. Yeah, I just looked at it quickly at my study Bible, but it, I, I can't extract it that quickly. Yeah. That's yeah. a good question. I don't know the answer, but yeah. absolutely it's true that it was oral first. And anytime you have an oral story, if you've ever played that telephone game where you somebody <laughs> has a secret at one end and you, and you whisper it down through the circle by the time it gets to the other end, it's not what it was. So um, any thought, any, uh, I wanted to give you a chance to discuss where we have, what we've talked about so far, anything that's jumping out at you from what we've just learn in this first passage. Uh, 
okay, you, you guys had a lot of things you shared already, so that's that's fine. Now we're going to go into the New Testament. Uh, we want to take the same interpret same approach to interpretation in the New Testament. Now I've chosen three mark readings from the Synoptic Gospels: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you hear all three readings, I think you'll see why I chose them. And again, listen closely to the details and jot down on your piece of paper anything that you notice when you compare one account to another. Okay, everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So the first one is in the book of Matthew chapter eight. I'll give you a second to find that. Matthew eight, one to four. Matthew eight, one to four. And I'll read, I will read that to you in the revised, the revised standard version. Matthew eight, one to four. So here's, here's what Matthew says. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and there was a leper who came to him and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying that he being Jesus, and touched him, saying, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. That's the first account. Here's the next one. Mark, chapter 1. Mark, mm -hmm. chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. Chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Chapter 1 now. Mark 1. We were at Matthew 8. Now we're Mark 1, 40 to 45. Okay, I'll read this one to you. A leper came to him, that being Jesus, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he, the leper, went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country and people came to him from every quarter. So if you notice anything different from the second account from the first account, you should be jotting those things down. Now we have a third account. This is from Luke. This is Luke chapter 5, 12 to 16. Luke chapter 5, 12 to 16. And here this is. Once when he, that is Jesus, was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him and said, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he, that is Jesus, ordered him, that is the leper, to tell no one. Go, Jesus said, and show yourself to the priest. And as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing, for a testimony to them. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. But he would withdraw to deserted places and pray. Hmm. Okay. During his ministry, Jesus healed many people, including lepers. What detail in the dialogue here makes it more likely that these three accounts are describing the same encounter? Well, what Jesus does is the same each time. Yes. <clears throat> But he's done that before. He's healed other lepers. So what is right. it about this story that nails it down a little bit that it's actually probably the same story? There's something. It's the, 
it's the dialogue between yes. the leper and yes. Jesus. Yeah. Is the, the dialogue is almost always the same. Right. And in part of that dialogue is Jesus saying something that I don't believe he says anywhere else in the Bible. I do choose. Yes. Never saw yeah. that anywhere else. So while he cured a lot of people, he healed a lot of people. He didn't, he's not quoted as saying, I do choose after he's been, the guy says, if you choose to do this, I'll be healed. I do choose. That's unusual. Dialogue wise. And you're absolutely right, Scotty. That, that's absolutely dead on right. The dialogue tips us off. This is probably without, without much doubt, the same encounter. Okay. But what happens, what's different about the, what did you notice that was different from one to the other? In the, the middle story, he, it was as if he disobeyed Jesus' request that he not speak of it. And it sort of seems that he is spreading the word. But in the third story, it just says sort of abstractly, people heard more about it and multitudes came. So it doesn't directly blame the cured leper. Right. And in the first account, there's no spread. They don't mention that. Right. So three different outcomes in these stories. We've already kind of suggested this is the same encounter, right? And the Bible has presented both of, all three of these accounts in inspired scripture, but there are contradictions here in it. What, what else did you notice? In the first two, it happens in the country. In the third reading, it happens in the city. Oh, oh that's, that's right. Heals a man down from the mountain. Very good. Anything else? I think that they use this as a way mm -hmm. to explain why Jesus didn't just go into the temple in Jerusalem and preach and convert sure. everyone. That he was driven out of necessity to go up into the mountains and the wildernesses in Galilee rather than in the big cities at the time. Yeah, he took the message to the people wherever they were. Yeah. What else did you notice that was different? Anything else? Sounds like Jesus was in the city, was surrounded by crowds and had to escape to be alone rather than that he tried not to be around other people. Yeah, yeah. In one of the accounts, there is a, an attribution to Jesus's state of what, what he's feeling. One of the gospel writers is, 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 uh, gives us the detail that the other two do not about what Jesus was feeling. Did you notice that? Well, it's hard to because you've got three different places in there. So I'll, I'll spare but you. Is it that the first and the third talk about the power? And the second one it is if you want to. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm not sure. I mean, in, both, in all the three cases, Jesus says, I do choose, be made clean. So there's not much ambiguity about Jesus' wanting to help. But there is something that Mark says about him that yeah. the other two do not. He says, um, Mark says, Jesus was moved with pity. Yeah, that's right. Moved yeah. with pity. Yeah. So Mark picked up on something that the other two did not. Now, interestingly, scholars who have studied the synoptics and have concluded that the Mark gospel is the oldest, you think it's, it's, it's a little bit interesting that the other two gospel writers chose to ignore that particular detail in their account of this. Mark has it in, the other two do not. They don't, they don't presume to tell us what Jesus is feeling or observe what Jesus is feeling and tell it to us. So what do you make of all these different, uh, they're not, some of them are contradictions, like for example, city versus country. Other things are contradictory in terms of the response, how the word got out. What does the, and, and we've just come from the Joshua account and we've learned some things about that. What do you, what do you get from this that you might not have gotten otherwise? What, what sorts of thoughts are you having about this past, these passages as a result of the way we looked at them? Can we just go back to the issue of contradiction? Okay. You say that Matthew and Luke chose to ignore 
Marx's word about pity. Yes. That's we not a contradiction. That's just an omission. We, we don't know that. All we know is that what we're reading today doesn't have it. But we have no idea over the generations whether that was left out for one reason or another. Okay. I'm not enough of a biblical scholar to be able to speak to that. Uh, I think that, um, I don't know that there's been that much trouble with containing the, the, the content. There's not a lot of disagreement about the content of the gospels in terms of how it's been handed down. There's not a lot of argument other than Mark, whether or not it continues to go on to a certain part or not. Uh, so I don't know, but yeah, you're right. We don't have a way to know for sure that it could have been that, that the other two gospel writers also included that and that for some reason it disappeared. So yes, we don't know that. But for us, at any case, what we, we have what we have and we read what we read. And so my question to you is, did anything come out of this expression, this, this discussion of these passages that you might not have gotten otherwise? Is the fact that there's differences and you're and you were I, I made you more conscious of the differences mm -hmm. by the first exercise. Did that have any impact on your understanding of these passages from the gospels? No. <laughs> I, I think it makes you look closely or closer yeah. to like those uh, in the funny papers where they'd have two pictures that are almost yeah. identical yeah. and you're supposed mm -hmm. to find 10 things that are different. You look much more closely at this little cartoon yeah. drawing than you normally would just because you are looking for the differences. Yeah, that's right. It does make you read it more closely and more carefully. Um, when I when I read these passages and and uh, this thought always occurs to me that Jesus says, you know, go, but don't tell anybody what's just transpired and that you've been cured. I'm thinking, really? Just seeing the man without all the sores on him, people are going to say, look at him. He looks fantastic. What happened to him? And Jesus, of course, did know that he was going to go and open his mouth and tell everybody what happened. He wants him to, to spread the word. But, but I'm always, I'm always amazed that Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Well, why, why do you think, why, well, speculate a little bit about why he might do that. Well, it says, it says he didn't, you know, in the one, and I forget which one, sorry, um, that now he can't go into town because everybody's clamoring and, and being around him and waiting to be healed. Okay, that's a good reason. It, 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 I have another one in mind. Is there anything else, anybody else? Yeah, Scotty? There, <clears throat> there was more to being unclean than just having leprosy as a disease. You could be unclean for many reasons and be unable to attend at temple because you were yes. unclean. It could okay. even be like just that you ate uh, a cheeseburger, you know? <laughs> or an alpha. So he wanted him to follow the Masonic law first. Yes. Yeah. And, and go, go and, and pay clean. his his fine and be proclaimed clean again by the priests. Right. Trying this is very early in, in uh the gospels and very early in his ministries and he doesn't want to go head to head with these guys yet he wants them to follow the the, the masonic law and that was part of it you're clean now you've got to go to the temple and you've got to show yourself to the priests and you have to pay pay the dues but he wanted them to do that first he, he, yeah, the, the, he doesn't say don't the, tell anyone ever. He says don't yeah. tell anyone until you go and are proclaimed clean. Very, very that, good. That's, that's, an good point. that's a very okay. interesting point. Can, can I read you the note from my study Bible? Sure. And it likens the Numbers 12 verses 10 to 15. It says, show yourself to the priest. Christ gives this command in order to convince the priests by a tangible miracle that he's superior to Moses. The priests hold Moses to be greater than Christ, yet Christ heals a leper immediately 
with his own divine authority. However, when Miriam was struck with leprosy, Moses had to seek mercy from above, and still she has only healed after seven days. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. So do you see how things begin to open up into really interesting directions from just taking this different approach of interpretation to these passages? Look at what you're coming up with. You know, if we were in a, if we were in a mine, look at all the nuggets you're, you're finding that you might not have found if you, A, read these gospel accounts independently of each other, hmm. right? Or right. B, that you read them so quickly because, oh, yeah, yeah, leper heel, yeah, I, I know the story, I've read this, you know, been there, done that, got it. Uh, but when you stop, when you put the brakes on and you really start to look at every single thing that's in there, all of a sudden we're talking about the Mosaic law, we're talking about Jesus not advocating for some kind of religious insurrection. He doesn't say, go out and tell everybody how great I am, right? All he says is, I'll choose to heal you, now go do the things that the Mosaic law tells you to do and be healed ritually as well as health uh, medically. Uh, and all these other different insights you guys have come up with just because you're reading this thing with, uh, you know, uh, a different set of eyeglasses. Uh, you're paying more attention to what you're reading. You switch eyeglasses. <laughs> so did- I think it's because I'm reading them with you guys, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, that, there's a really good reason why Bible study, group Bible study is a great thing because you, you, you're always more than the sum of your parts. And you also can learn from the wisdom of the other people in the group, as we have done today. I mean, you, there's lots of things y'all have mentioned that I didn't put in there um, that I think are really worth thinking about. Did any of the, did your understanding of this encounter, was it enhanced, was it enhanced, your understanding, by the three points of view? Really? No? <laughs> okay. I, I, I love comparing these, um, similar stories in the synoptics because of the framing and I because um, as was mentioned Valerie before talking about legend and you know oral storytelling came up we can think ourselves um, that we are objective storytellers when we tell an event in our lives but let's be honest we come at it from a particular perspective and we're speaking to a particular audience and so each of these gospel writers, like Matthew and Luke, were working with Mark as well as um, Q, another source, but they were speaking in a particular moment in time to a particular community. And so that's why, for example, this morning with the sermon, the Beatitudes in Luke are different than the Beatitudes in Matthew. One is not better than the other, but they're speaking to a different reality in a different moment or community. And to me, that's exciting. Um, and it does remind us that there are those kernels of the original story, the original dialogue and exchange, um, but that there's something to be offered in the perspective that Luke gives versus Mark versus Matthew. And, and there might be a moment that one speaks like a, we might feel like we're in the country in one moment or in the city or feel like we wanna stay quiet with the secret that is Jesus. And in other moments, we might feel really comfortable sharing. So I love an opportunity to notice the framing and the broader story within each gospel. So this is great. Well, and, and, and uh, did, did one particular frame, this is to everybody, uh, speak to you more than the other? Did one of the gospel accounts speak to you more because of how it framed the story and the emphasis that it put? And maybe not, maybe you haven't had a chance to think about it, but did, I'm just giving you the opportunity to way in if you felt that way if one really resonated with you in a way the other two didn't i think i would like to prefer marks because i i did like the insight into jesus felt sorry for the man like i think yes. that's i would agree that really adds to the story and lets us in a little bit that's excellent that's great thank you for sharing that so the other thing i was going to say for me the dialogue that we give that we get from Jesus, I do choose. Yes. Be made clean. Gives me a sense of confidence that this is something that happened. This is not literary. 
This is reportage. Because I think if you were there and you heard that said, I do choose, be made clean. Those are words you'll probably never forget. There's only six, six words, right? If I count it, I'm doing this on the fly. Yeah, six words, that's all he said. But it was those six words that he chose that are so powerful and so unusual. For me, that makes me more confident that this is not just some made up fable. This is something, this is an attempt to, to report on something that actually did happen, which I think is important. Okay. So do you see now how interpretation pay, plays an important role in reading the Bible? Mm. Do you understand that all questions do not have to be resolved in order for the passage to have impact? Right? We didn't resolve all the contradictions in either of those, either the Old Testament or the New Testament, but it had impact on us in the things that you've been sharing. Okay. So every time you take a careful and thoughtful study of a biblical passage, and you can do this anytime, anywhere, you don't need commentaries, you don't need a group, you can do this on your own, and you still will have some interesting insights if you focus on what you're reading, uh, especially on your own, in fact. With, without comments from theologians, you carry something from, with you from that experience. These are the metaphorical stones that you pick up from the river of faith. And they can serve as a memorial in your mind to God's willingness to be personal and enlightening and even a little bit miraculous. What thoughts do you find in your head afterwards that you know you didn't put there? Do you see how your awareness of this can lead to making choices to care for someone else, even someone you suddenly find in your thoughts, despite not thinking of them for a while. Can you imagine yourself saying, like Jesus, I do choose. If this seems a little mysterious, well, it is. If it seems a little bit miraculous, well, it's that too. Any further thoughts or discuss things or comments that you'd like to make, things that you've experienced in this area that you'd like to share with us? Do we have, I'm going to show my ignorance as a Catholic who, who took religion all those years and even theology in a freshman year, but, but never read any of the Bible. I don't know how Scotty did, but somehow. Um, punishment. You know, what? Punishment. <laughs> he was in detention. So I, all these nuances and interesting mm -hmm. details, do we know that there were healings? Were there any commentaries that tell us that, yes, there were repeated healings? So one thing that's important to note is that there were different types of healers in Jesus's right, day. Right, right. Right. So physicians did not touch anyone. Wow. They, they theorized about the sources of the illness. But peasant healers willingly okay. risked themselves okay. and did touch like Jesus is described. Okay. So um, the, the yeah, healed, because if the, you yeah, go if on, you step. touched a leper, you were unclean too. Oh, I know, yeah. I know. Right, right. But that yeah. yeah, so physicians did a they they made theories, and so there's ways in which Jesus fits into multiple roles. Um, okay. teacher, healer, prophet, okay. holy man. And some of the language to talk about him was pre-existing language, right? A lot of it, son of man, but a lot of it was also, um, uh, so a lot of it comes out of obviously Judaism, but it also some of the titles for Jesus were ones claimed by the emperor. So it's profoundly political and we miss that today. Um, but yeah, the healings like are part of how he's characterized in terms of uh, feeding the crowd. So right. feeding them right. in food, in education, but also through physical healing. I see. Um, and yet when he appeared to his disciples, his wounds were not healed. Mm. Yeah. And so there are disability rights Christians 
who interpret that um, in con like one I'm thinking of who wrote the disabled God. She grew up in a religious environment, a Christian environment where she was born with a disability and was constantly been taking to faith healers to pray her disability away. And, you know, can you imagine that's like an awful experience for a child? And so she came to a more authentic theology um, herself, but she wrote the disabled God to say, remember when he comes back, he still has his wounds. He's still wounded. Mm. And so there isn't, you know, that, and so part of, I think what's being played with too is, is that idea that was mentioned before of what's unclean and what's clean. Yeah. That he's changing that on its head. And a lot of it has more to do, less to do about the physical healing of blindness or leprosy and more about being included back in the community that has marginalized you. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it. And But what Al brings up in terms of comparing different texts, those of you who are doing the scripture as art, even if you're just spending time in the scripture, you can do that with the three transfiguration stories in the synoptics, and they have differences in them. Um, and, you know, that's part of why it was like, oh, we can go with Luke. Luke has like some unique things going on. <laughs> so you can, you can look those three up and just kind of spend some time noticing. Um, mm. But the question about whether or not he actually healed um, uh, is is a, is another way of understanding. That's that your people are your whoever asked the question. I don't even remember. Uh, you're you're wanting to you're still wanting to not there for there not to be contradiction. You know, in saying, well, did they did, did, was it true? Did yeah. it happen? You know, yeah. and, and what I'm trying to tell you is you don't have to know that. Yeah, I get it. To learn from the passages. Yeah. You, don't have to resolve that. You don't have to resolve the contradictions. Right. All you need to do is flow along with the contradictions. Okay, Let them mark. take you where yeah, they're going to take you. Right? Yes, thank you. I like that. And that takes a huge amount of, of uh, stress out of Bible study. Yes. Because so much of the time we go to the Bible and we say, okay, I've got to find out the actual thing that it's trying to tell me, you know, and it's, it's a much more mysterious and miraculous process. Illumination, enlightenment is like that. It's not ritual. You don't say, you don't click your heels three times and say, I, you know, whatever she said. No place like home. Like a, a totally and, and I think one of the wonderful things of the gospels is how narrative they are, um, because there were also sayings gospels. And some of which included, you know, an encounter here or there, but they didn't, they didn't have this narrative flow. Um, and, you know, we think in narratives. So it's super helpful to place Jesus, you know, in a narrative and people, the, the three, at just looking at the Synoptic Gospels, they're going to, again, choose to include a story in a different spot in the gospel because of how it positions. And we had that recently. Um, with the Luke's version of Jesus going to the hometown synagogue and reading from the scroll of Isaiah, that's mm -hmm. positioned totally differently in, in other ones. And, you know, he's making a choice and a statement, but it's, it's again, how we would tell a story in our own life. Mm -hmm. We might choose to tell an order that makes, well, emphasizes is, a point. That's absolutely good. And, and, the, and another way to look at that, like I think the money lenders uh, turning over the table of the money lenders, that yeah. happens in different places too. And so you, 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 as you ponder the fact that it's in different places, and again, you have this instinct to resolve the conflict, you might think in terms instead of, well, what if it happened early on in his ministry, and yet by the end of his ministry, people were still talking about it? Mm -hmm. And so the one writer shows you the thing in the time that it happened, if that was the time that it happened. And the other writer is saying it had lasting impact, right? When you start to unscrew all the rigid thinking that you have been approaching this with, all of a sudden you get kind of creative. And God is absolutely the author of creativity. And, and he can teach us all kinds of really interesting things by Create by in these creative approaches, looking at this thing in a totally new way because you something jumped out at you, and that's really what I think God wants us to do with the Bible. That is at the heart of Bible 101. 
is to not get all bent out of shape about it. Don't get all nervous about it. Don't be all an anxious that you're not going to get it right or that you're not going to find the magic thing or where Waldo is or any of that. Just let it happen the way it's going to happen. And God in the Holy Spirit will give you the, the illumination. He will, the, the light will be shed wherever it needs to be shed for you. Your interpretation, you know, when I asked earlier, which of these three accounts did most, most meaningful to you? I was really interested to hear that different things reach to, to different people. That's the wonderful thing about God. He is that individual and he is that personal that he can match your unique personhood to the passages and the insights that are greatest for you. And if you think that way, if you begin to have confidence in the Bible in that way, it's a lot better read. It's a much more enjoyable experience, right? Do you see what happened today? Yeah. You went into these two obscure passages, or you never had put these three together, probably. You know, we, we slugged through it together. We, we got through all the repetition of Joshua. We did all the different things. And yet, I mean, when I go back and play this tape, I'm going to just really revel at all the insights that you all shared with me that I hadn't thought about. Uh, that's really exciting. That's what I believe Bible study can always be. And if it hasn't been that way for you, maybe this, will, this approach will make it easier for it to be that way for you and unique to you. Any other final passing comments before we close? Okay. I, 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 thank you. I, I was just going to say what exactly Al's point and the fact that you could read the same passage at a different point in your life and yeah. something new is yeah. God is communicating to you. And so I think that's the real invitation and opportunity to bring yourself to the text. Yes. Yes, absolutely. All right, let me let me close us with prayer. Holy Lord God, guide us in our experience with scripture and shed your light upon those pages that we read. Open our minds and our hearts. Teach us the unique lessons that you intend for each of us. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Al. Thank you. Yes, Al. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, we will meet again in March. Uh, I, I haven't really quite nailed down the topic yet, but I will let you know. Not worried uh, about it. <laughs> uh, yep. but, uh, thank you so much for all the great insights you all shared today. That was so perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Have right. a good day. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Have a good day, week. Yeah, yeah. Love and is love is love is love is love. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right.